Well, good morning, Northside. Grace and peace, everyone. Yeah, my name is Jacob. Uh, I'm on the teaching team. And I'm just off the cuff, um, off the top, just going to say something controversial. And you're just going to hear it, and then you can respond however you feel like you need to respond. But here it comes. I hate the 4th of July. <laughs> yeah, okay, 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 okay. Don't tar and feather me and throw me in the Boston Harbor. That's not what we're looking for here. Um, I hate the 4th of July. Now listen, hear my heart. I love freedom. I, I understand how blessed we are to live in America. I understand that we, we, like, we have freedom. We want to celebrate that. I just personally hate at-home fireworks. Anybody else with me in this room? Yeah, a few of us, all right? I, I'm good with, I love Thunder Over Louisville, but at-home fireworks is just not for me. Um, I, I, I have a hard time going to sleep, hard time staying asleep, anybody else? And so at night, like when the 4th of July is going on, I just hear these like booms over the place. And it's interesting, my neighborhood must be like super patriotic because they celebrate the 4th of July, June 30th, um, July 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th, like October 3rd sometimes, sometimes December 31st. There's been times, I kid you not, me and Danielle are just at home. It's like a, it's like a Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. in the middle, I don't, you name a month, and all of a sudden we just see a, right? Like, there's no reason why, it was just a firework. And we're like, freedom, like, like awesome, we love that. And I, I get why we celebrate it. I understand how important the 4th of July is for us. If you're British in this room, we love you. Go Manchester United, but na na boo boo, we won, you lost. Like it's over. We, we, we have our freedom now. We get to live how we wanna, we get to live how we wanna live. And, and, and I, America is like, we, we are known for talking about freedom. We are known for loving freedom. We are called the land of the free. And it's beautiful because we get to live free. We have the freedom to actually live free. You think of the rights that are protected, even in just the First Amendment, like the fact that we are standing here, sitting here right now in church. We have the freedom to be free and, and worship in public how we want to. That is not the case all over the world. I hope we understand that. The fact that we get to do this is not the case everywhere. We have the freedom to be free in worship. We have the freedom to be free with our speech, that we have a thing called Facebook where you can say whatever you want to and for some reason you don't get arrested, right? Like it's just out there. Like you have the freedom to be free. We have the freedom of the press where we can put out reports. We can read things that we agree with and disagree with and both are okay. We have the freedom of petition that we can take our grievances to the government. We have the freedom of assembly that we can peacefully assemble. I mean, we have these freedoms to live free. That's worth celebrating. And that's why we blow up plastic. It's awesome. And listen, if I feel like if we can agree, if we can find some common ground about that, that we're like, yeah, like we have the freedom to be free. Like it's awesome. How much more important is it then? Not just in our political and our physical life, but in our spiritual and eternal life that we have been set free to live in freedom. We have been set free to be free. We're in Galatians and we've been walking through it um, and, and we're getting to, to chapter five right now. Let me just invite you. We're just gonna hang out in chapter five all, all morning. And so if you've got your Bible, if you've got your phone, if you've got your iPad, if you brought your Mac, if you, I don't know, if you have the little uh, Galatians booklet, feel free to go there right now because we're gonna really go through a lot of Galatians five. It's a lot of scripture. I'm really excited about it. Um, and here's how Paul starts this in Galatians 5, chapter, or Galatians 5, verse 1. And we're just going to read through 1 through 12 really quick and just see how important in his mind this freedom that we have is. It says this, if you're a highlighter, if you're an underliner, if you're a circular, verse 1, start there. All right, so start right there. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. That's that, do that one right there. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. The same way in America, we have been set free that we can live for freedom. In Christ, we've been set free that we can live with freedom. Then he goes to verse two. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Now pause for just a second. We have to remember what's going on here. Paul has come to the, to the Galatians and he has said, listen, you have Jesus, you're free. 
But then another group has come, they're called the Judaizers, and they come in and they say, listen, you, if you really wanna be a great follower of Jesus, you gotta follow the law still. And he uses this example of circumcision. He says, if you just cut a little part off your body, then Jesus is finally going to accept you. If you can just do this and you can follow the law, then, then you're gonna be accepted by Jesus. And Paul says, that is not the case. Do not let yourself be, be taken in this way. Look how serious he gets in the rest of these verses. Verse three. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. And I'm confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished and it brings it home with verse 12. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. <laughs> that means exactly what you think it means. <laughs> and if you don't know what that means, anyone else on the teaching team would love to walk you through <laughs> what that means. <laughs> No pun intended, this is his most cutting language in the book of Galatians so far. <laughs> I just gotta throw one in there. Um, look how serious it is, it's in the Bible. It is right there in the Bible. He says, if you think cutting off like a little, a little piece of your body is gonna do you right, like you're gonna be justified in Christ, keep going. And he, I mean, it's, it, it is intense language. This is how important it is to Paul. He says, you have been set free to live in freedom. Verse one says, stand firm. Do not let yourself again go under the burden, go, be burdened again by a yoke of slavery, but stand firm. And Paul's saying this is worth celebrating, this is worth living in, this is worth defending. And I think it's just important for us to pause and see that, that Christianity can get a bad rap sometime. For, for having this religion that is based on regulations and rules and constraints and laws, and maybe that's you right now. You're walking in here and you're like, okay, I gotta make sure I look a certain way, act a certain way. Did I do this last night? Like, you're thinking of all the laws that you gotta follow. And Paul says, no, no, no. The, the, the Father's heart for you, his will for you is to live in freedom. That is good news. That is great news. And it doesn't matter if, if you're a believer in this room or if you're a non-believer, that is good news for everyone. If you're a believer in this room, it's good news because all of a sudden you, your standing with Jesus is not based on the law anymore. 613 regulations, commandments in the law of Moses, which he's talking about. And all of a sudden it's, it's not about, all right, how many of those 613 did you complete? Did you do this week? Have you done in your life? That's gonna decide your standing with Jesus. It's not about that. He's saying, do you have faith in the Lord? Do you walk in faith with Jesus? There's your standing. It's not about this, 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 these karma rules that sometimes we can pull into our Christianity, our Christian faith, where it's like, I've done this bad thing this week, so I gotta do two good things to make it up, and then God won't be mad at me, and then I'll be good. If I can just even out my life to make sure I'm here and God's good with me, maybe I can do a couple more good things. It's not about that. You have imputed righteousness. You have been credited righteousness through Jesus. That is good news. If you're a non-believer, in this room. And you're thinking, man, I gotta clean up my act before I come to Jesus. Maybe you know someone in your life that's like this. You hear this phrase, if I walked into the church, like I'd burst into flames. If I walked into a church, this church, like it, the, the walls would come down. I got two pieces of good news for you. Number one, we got fire extinguishers. Number two, we're still standing. <laughs> you know why? It's because Jesus has done the work of cleaning up your act for you. You don't have to come with Jesus to Jesus with clean hands. He cleans them. You have been justified through Christ. You have been brought from a unright standing into a right standing through the event of the cross, through Jesus. And that is good news. 
That is the freedom that we have in Christ. Not to live in slavery, but to live freely. Look at verse 1 again. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Fireworks go off. Boom. Yeah. But here's the deal. Yes, that's true. We have the freedom. But this does not mean that we have an invitation just to go absolutely crazy. The gospel is an invitation. It's an invitation to Jesus, to to life, to eternal life, to this beautiful thing. But the gospel is not an invitation to live sinfully, but an invitation to live purposefully, to live a fuller, better, bigger life. If you don't believe me, listen to how Paul says it in Galatians 5, 13. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Again, freedom. You have freedom, freedom, freedom. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. And how I would describe that, just so it's easy and digestible for everybody in this room, is that freedom in Christ isn't an invitation to live sinfully. It is an invitation to live purposefully. It's kind of like this, not exactly like this, but it's kind of like this. Um, Do you guys remember when you got your license? Like that moment where you got your license. Maybe you don't have your license yet and you're looking forward to it. Um, it, it, It's just this great moment. I remember leaving the license branch and I had my little piece of paper that had my picture on it. I was just like, yes. Like William Wallace freedom scream. I have my freedom now. Like I don't have a car, but I had my freedom. Like I had my license to do what I wanted to do. And I just wanted to go home and get in my parents' car and like wind in my hair, hair, like wheel in my hands, just drive around. And I remember like I got home after my license and I asked my parents, I was like, all right, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. Like I'm just gonna go and, and, and drive. And they're like, great. Like, let me tell you where you can drive to. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, I, I, there's places I can drive to. They said, you can drive to your friend Seth and Caleb's house, which is 2.6 miles away. And I was like, okay, that's one place. Where else can I drive? They're like, and you can also come home. Like, <laughs> those are the two places you get to go to. And I had the freedom, like legally, I had this piece of paper that said, I can go wherever. I can drive to Louisville. I could drive to Florida. I could drive to, I don't know, Canada. I can go wherever I want to. But with my freedom from my parents came a, came a purpose and direction. And it's not exactly the same, but I think you understand that our, our freedom is not just the invitation to do whatever we want to. It is the invitation to live purposefully. But here's the scary thing. We're supposed to live with freedom. We're not supposed to live this sinful life and we're also not supposed to go to the law. How do we do that well? Because some of us can hear that and we're like, believer's freedom, there's no rules. I'm gonna go over here, I'm gonna do whatever I want to. Like, I'm good to go, I'm covered by grace. It's true, I'm gonna go do anything. But Paul invites us, he says, that's not how you should live. And some of us are like, well, I don't wanna do the wrong thing. So I'm just gonna look at the law. I'm gonna grade myself by what I do. And that, that's not what you're supposed to do either. Somehow we can't live in these extremes. We have to live right here in this freedom that Christ provides us. How do we do that well? Paul's got the answer. Verse 16, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. And he's he's asking the Galatians, but let me just ask you, do you want that freedom? Do you want to live in this freedom of life that is bigger and bolder and better? Here's how you do it. You walk. You live by the Spirit and not by the flesh. Now, maybe right now you're asking, I want that. What are those two words? What does that mean? What is the Spirit? What is the flesh? Um, the, the Spirit is the Holy Spirit. It is the, the, the indwelling of God in humans. It is Jesus Christ living in us. And it's, it's not just an it, it is a he. The Holy Spirit is, is alive and active. He is moving. He is a force with us. He lives with us. He guides us. He prompts us. And can I just be honest with you? I always like to be honest about my faith journey so that if you have questions, you don't feel like you're the only one. I used to be super weirded out by the Spirit. I was good with God. 
Loved the idea of Jesus, loved it. But then when I heard this idea of like a force living inside of me that talks to me and tells me what to do, I could only think of the, the angel and the, the devil on my shoulders that were like, do this, don't do this. I was like, I don't know, like that's us, Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit in my life is everything. And living by the Spirit has changed everything. And so if you're, you're there, and you're thinking, I don't know about the spirit. I don't know about that. Let me just challenge you to give yourself permission this weekend to lean in and see what the spirit has. See what the spirit looks like for you. And then there's the life according to the flesh. The flesh is not just the body. I'm not saying live life according to your bicep. That's not what I'm saying. Um, David De Silva, he's a Galatians scholar. He says it like this. It's the sum total, all right? It's, it's all these things. It's the impulses urges and desires, impulses, urges, and desires that lead human beings away from virtue and towards self-promotion and self-gratification. And this comes often at the expense of the interests and well-being of both others and at the expense of accomplishing the purposes of God in our lives in the world. And so in, in, in one moment, it's, this, it's these impulses, these desires, these urges that are doing what you wanna do, they're giving you self-gratification and self-promotion, but they're also coming at the expense of the well-being of others, and they're not accomplishing what God has planned for you and for the world. And, and maybe right now you're thinking like, oh yeah, I already know what that is. Like in my life, I know, I know what that impulse is, I know what that desire is, I know what that urge is. Maybe you don't, Paul has this list right here of all these, these um, they're called the acts of the flesh, but think about it like this, the results of the flesh. When you live by the flesh, here's what life looks like. And they're broken up into these four sections. The first one are called the sensual sins. And it's this, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Now pause for just a second. Sometimes we think our world is, is crazy messed up when it comes to, to just how we view sex. Let me tell you right now, the Greco-Roman world was absolute sexual chaos. It, I mean, it was just unbelievable to the point where Paul has to use three different words and phrases to talk about all the sexual sin that is going on in the Greco-Roman world. The idea behind these words um, is this. The first one is, is sex outside the bounds of marriage. Then it goes to this, sexual actions outside the bounds of marriage that don't include intercourse or even with another person. This is a reference to pornography. The word's por pornania. Like even back then, pornography existed. It wasn't just the, the, the advent of the internet that brought pornography. Even in the Greco-Roman world, this existed. And the last one is, is lewdness and lewd talk. And Paul's saying this, if that's what the results of your life are looking like, if those things are in your life, that does not come by living by the Spirit. It comes by living by the flesh. The Holy Spirit is never going to lead you into those things. The next grouping of sins um, is this, this idea of the idolatry and sorcery, it's called the religious sins. And maybe you know what idolatry is, but sorcery is interesting. Um, and, and maybe you're like, I knew it, right? Like sorcery's on there. But the, the words for sorcery is pharmakia. It's the word we, we use, or we, that, that pharmacy comes from. It's drug use as well. And there's definitely uh, people dealing with the occult, but there's also people who thought they were dealing with dead people, but really they were just high. Like this is in, in like history, we see this. And, and what Paul is saying is, I mean, the Holy Spirit is never gonna lead you into idolatry or into sorcery or to an abuse of drugs. That's just not gonna be the Holy Spirit's way. That's living by the flesh. The next are the people sins, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, maybe your Bible says divisions, and envy. Again, these are the results of living in the flesh. If your interactions with people or how you view people is defined by that, it's, not, it's just not the Holy Spirit living that way. It's, it's the, the flesh guiding in that way. And the last two are the social sins. First one is drunkenness, and the second one um, is orgies. And if you don't know what orgies are, I'd like to invite you to ask any of our teaching team members, not myself, <laughs> to explain what that is. And if you think that's weird for you to hear from me, just remember, my parents are in the room right now. And so, like, <laughs> imagine how I feel. But really what's interesting is that word orgy, it, 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 
it's really like this wild revelries. And so yes, everything that you think of, like all, all those like sexual sins are a part of that, but it's really like the culmination of everything in that. It's just these chaotic parties where it's just out of control and there's just so much debauchery and there's just so much wildness. And then it's drunkenness too. And this is not like a hard line, Paul saying like alcohol is the devil, but he is saying you, the Holy Spirit will never lead you into drunkenness. It's just not gonna happen. That is a work of the flesh. And these are all these results of living by the flesh, but then he ends with this greater result, which I think is gonna sit heavy for us. Because listen to what this greater result is at the end of 21, Galatians 5, 21. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that's heavy, but let me um, assure you of something and also challenge you in something in that verse. Paul is not saying, hey, if you've ever committed one of these sins, like one way elevator trip south, right? Like that's just not what he's saying. He, he's, he, it's this idea of continual and, and, and consistent action. That word living is a pre present participle. And so it's, it's you live this way continually and consistently without repentance, that you're just going this way for the purpose of going this way. And let me just be so, so clear. No one is ever outside the bounds of grace for Jesus, ever. But there is a moment, Paul says, where if you keep walking, 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 it's not that, you're, that Jesus can't reach you. It's just the fact that you're not reaching for Jesus. And he says, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And even more than that, we might just think that, oh man, I'm not gonna go to heaven. It's, it's deeper than that. Jesus came to give life and life to the full after the earth, but on the earth too. And so this is, you're missing the fullness of life on earth if you live in this way is what Paul's saying. He's saying you might feel the fullness of the flesh, but you are missing the fullness of life that is available to you. You are missing the freedom that you can have in Christ, this full freedom, this full life. And you have to remember that the gospel is an invitation. Freedom in Christ is an invitation to not live sinfully, but to live purposefully. And you have to do that by walking by the Spirit. Look at the difference and what the results of living by the Spirit are. And maybe you heard those things above and you're like, I don't know, that sounds pretty awesome. <laughs> like, that sounds like a good life. Let me just, here's the difference of when you live by the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. This is a circle underlined highlight, by the way. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. How interesting is it? We've talked so much about the law. Don't live by the law. And he says, here's the fruit of the Spirit. There's no law against these things. And I said, I hear th that list I don't know about you, but I think, man, that sounds bigger and bolder and better to me. This idea of love, the word is agape, it's unconditional love. The ability just to have this love for people around you, regardless of who they are, or what they've done. It is a love that has just as much to do with your heart as it does your mind. It is a decision to love people. A life that's defined by joy sounds pretty great. That is defined by not my external circumstances, but my internal occupation, which is the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus. This life defined by peace, this, this idea of shalom, that is this wholeness, fullness, wellness, and security. A life defined by patience, not just at the grocery store in line where I'm like, okay, I can wait. Thank you, Spirit. But it's this patience to walk with people, and to love people, and to deal with their faults and to deal with where they've fallen short. This gentleness and this self-control, let me speak to the men in the room really quickly. You might hear gentleness and self-control and be like, I'm out. That's weakness. I'm not trying to have my life defined by gentleness and self-control. This is the epitome of strength, is what, what Paul is saying. It's not just the fact that you're, you're weak and you're gentle. It is the idea of always having the exact right reaction no matter what the situation holds. You can gently approach people, but you have the self-control not to fly off the handle or to go crazy, but you are strength in a world that is wild. 
I don't know about you, but that sounds bigger and bolder and better. And these things don't just simply come by trying harder, by the way. I don't think you can get up and just be like, all right, more joy today. Here we go. And go. it just doesn't happen like that. I mean, just pick one of these. Love. You want to be more love in life. You want to be a more loving spouse, a more loving parent, a more loving friend. You can try. You can be like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get up and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the store and get some flowers today. I'm going to go and, and, and take someone to get ice cream. Like, that's good. That's good stuff. But what if you live by the Spirit instead? And you lived and said, okay, Spirit, how am I supposed to love my, my family today? How am I supposed to love my wife today? How am I supposed to love my husband, my friends today? And see what happens. Maybe it'll come in this moment where you're supposed to ask a question you didn't even know you were supposed to ask. But it's the right question at the right time. That's the work of the Spirit, and it's showing love. Maybe it comes in the form of you just feel you're supposed to text a friend. Someone's on your mind. You don't know why they're, you're on your mind all day. You're like, man, like this person just, mm, I, just need to, I just need to shoot them a text and see what's up. And you find out things that you, you could have never expected because you sent one text. You want to be a, a more loving person. Walk by the Spirit and you will see a life that is changed. Church, that is the freedom that Paul is talking about. It is not just this invitation to live sinfully. It is an invitation to live purposefully. It is an invitation to walk by the Spirit. And it's even crazier. In Galatians 5, it says, when you walk by the Spirit, you will fulfill the law. You're doing everything at once. That is my goal. I would love for our, our church to be fined by the, the fruit of the Spirit. That people know Northside as a place that is full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And when we leave this place, it carries with us. And no matter where we go, that's how people know us. And so to end here, let me just encourage you to live by the Spirit. But maybe you're like, okay, how do I do that? Like, I don't know what that looks like. This is a foreign concept to me. I've just got a few, a few practices you can try this week. If you've never lived by the Spirit before and you're like, I'm interested. I want to try. I want to see what this looks like. Here's a few things you can do. Number one will be this. Simply ask the Spirit to guide you. Have a conversation. Pray to the Spirit and be like, Holy Spirit, I am looking to walk by you this week. I want you to guide me. You can do it in an overarching way that says, all right, it's Sunday. Like, Holy Spirit, can you cover me until next Sunday? And then we can talk again. You can do that. Or what I think is way, way more impactful is what if before you walk into a meeting tomorrow, you pause and you say, Spirit, whatever I'm supposed to say in this meeting, will you, will you make it known? Before you rush in and have this discipline moment with your kids this week, what if you paused I said, okay, Spirit, teach me how in this moment I can be loving and full of joy and still do what I need to do. Before you have a hard conversation with your spouse, before you have a night out with your friends, I mean, we could go through every single moment. Pause and just ask, okay, Spirit, guide me, prompt me, lead me. The second thing to do though is once you ask that, um, you gotta be expecting that he's gonna move. And so start to be mindful and open to things in life that are a little weird. What do I mean by that? Maybe you'll be at home and you've asked the spirit to do something and you've asked the spirit to guide you in a certain way. And all of a sudden you just feel this weird prompting inside of you. It's something you've, yeah, you've never felt before. And you're like, I don't, I don't know, this is weird. Maybe you're gonna be driving down the road and you're just gonna, I, I don't know. I mean, the spirit is so open to ex experiences, I have no idea. Maybe you're gonna see a friend and you're just gonna have this feeling that I need to pray for this person right now. Like I need to go and like pray with them. I don't know what it's about, but I'm like, hey, I feel like I'm supposed to pray for you. Can I pray for you really quickly? Maybe you're gonna feel this, this need to like we said to talking about, or we said a second ago is, is to protect someone. You're just gonna feel these weird things. That's the spirit working, church. It's not just your lunch coming up in a weird way. It's the Spirit working in your life. And once you feel that, that prompting, that whisper, that, that knowledge, I would challenge you just to respond accordingly. 
I never said this, that walking by the Spirit was easy. But my gosh, do the fruit of the Spirit make it worth it? So be bold. Maybe you're thinking, how do I know if it's the Spirit or not? Like, I feel this in my heart, Jacob. I feel like I'm supposed to do this. How do I know if it's the Spirit, if it's something else? Two questions you can ask yourself. Number one, um, is it biblical? What I'm about to do, is it biblical? Would Jesus do that? And if the answer is yes, then you can feel pretty right. But the second thing would be this, um, is what I'm going to do, is it against the works of the flesh? Is it the opposite of the works of the flesh? And the good news is if, if both of those things are a yes, if it's biblical and Jesus would do it, and if it's against the works of the flesh, you can do it. And if it's not the spirit, oh no, but if it is the spirit, that's great. But if it's not the spirit, the worst thing you did was something Christ-like for someone in your community. And that's beautiful. But if I had to guess, if, if both of those questions are a yes, you're starting to walk and live by the spirit. And you're just gonna see a life that looks different. I'm encouraging you um, to try that this week. We're about to sing a song that's all about the spirit of God. Maybe this is your chance to have that moment to talk to the spirit. Maybe some of the words in this song will be the exact prayer that you need to pray. We need your presence. We don't wanna leave this moment, whatever it looks like for you. But maybe use this song as that prayer. But listen to how Paul ends this chapter to talk about how important the spirit is and where we should use the spirit in our lives. Verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the spirit, ready for this? Let us follow the spirit's leading in every part of our lives. May that be true of us. Lord, we love you. Lord, we are so thankful that you sent the Spirit. Lord, when you, you left earth, Jesus, you sent the helper to come and then live among us, to, to be inside of us, to guide us, to prompt us. Let us live by that today, Lord, this week, our whole lives. Let that be how we are defined. God, I pray that, that for us this week, the spirit is clear in the ways that we are supposed to move. Don't even give us a shadow of a doubt that when we feel something, we just instantly are attuned to the fact that it is the spirit moving in our lives. And then please God, give us the boldness and the courage to respond accordingly. You've never said that it's always going to be easy to follow the spirit, but Lord, it is worth it to follow the spirit. We love you. May we follow the Spirit in every part of our lives. Amen.